so we moving down to the lower GI now to the uh, co-chairs uh, Devinder Raju and uh, Gary Nin. Uh, Devinder is a surgeon at the Lama McEwen Hospital and Gary a gastroenterologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and Royal Adelaide Hospital. So they'll introduce the next uh, speaker and the, the following speakers and their talks. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Associate Professor Ho to give us a talk on quality indicators for screening colonoscopy. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Xiao Hui Ho. I'm from uh, Malaysia. So uh, this is my second time visiting Adelaide. Uh, I want to thank you, Professor Rajvinder and the team for inviting me. So uh, can I uh, have my slides? Okay, this is a beautiful view of the Adelaide Hill. So uh, I was here two, three years ago. I ran a car, drove through this hill. It was so, so uh, peaceful and beautiful. So my task today is to speak on the uh, quality indicators of uh, in screening colonoscopy. And I uh, have no conflict of interest to, dis to dis declare. So just a bit of background. As we all know that uh, most of the colorectal cancer started with this adenoma carcinoma sequence. So colonoscopy allows us to, to detect pre-malignant uh, lesions or malignant uh, colorectal lesion at early stage. And with that, we're able to uh, confer endoscopy resections, early detection, and early resections, and this reduces the incidence of CRC diagnosis and mortality. So, in these uh, interesting uh, studies, I look at the long term follow up on the 2,600 patients who had colonoscopy and polypectomy, follow up for a median time of 15.8 years. It shown that the, uh, the colorectal cancer. Uh, death is reduced by 53% as compared to the normal population with, this, with the same duration of time. So, as we all know that colonoscopy is very important, so the quality indicators now uh, serve as a, as, a, as a key to monitor the, the quality of the colonoscopy. So, these are the three, do, three main domains that we are looking at. First is the technical aspect of it. Second is patient safety. And third is the patient experience. So in no priority, I will come to this in detail. So in no priority, uh, in no order of priority, the first uh, quality indicator good, is good power preparations. So in this uh, multi centers European study, it is shown that fair and good quality uh, bowel, bowel preparations confer high poly detection rate, give you a better sickle intubation and shorter procedure time. And it also shown in many meta-analyses that the good power preparation improve ADR, reduce poly, poly miss rate. And uh, it is uh, no surprise that US multi-society multi task force endorse, uh, endorse it. And uh, it also gives you the uh, importance of a good power prep. If a patient has poor power prep, the procedure is recommended to be repeat uh, within a year. But if the power prep is good, even you have an adenoma, size of 1 cm, Less than certain number of, uh, of polyps, the surveillance is five years interval. This is just as an as um, example. So it is very important to document bowel preparation status. Um, perhaps it will be good to document it in a more objective manner rather than a descriptive word like poor, unsatisfactory, or, or fair. So one of it is, uh, is a Boston bowel prep score, which perhaps you can consider to use. Uh, this Boston bowel prep score, basically you have a uh, Four score here is from zero to three. Zero means uh, full of uh, feces materials where you can't visualize the mucosa as well, uh, at all. One means uh, there are some uh, uh, mucosa can be visualized, but the rest of the fecal material cannot be washed away. Two means a uh, small amount of uh, fluid fecal material where you can wash away and visualize the mucosa. Of course, three is the excellence. There's no fecal material at all, and you are you are needed to grade three segments of the colon, namely the left colon, transverse colon, uh, and the right colon. Okay, left colon means descending uh, sigmoid and rectums. So we have a total score of nine. Of course, the lower score will be zero. And the, the acceptance of fair score should be about five and above. But I think any segments, if you've got one or so, you have to be, you have to be worried, perhaps slightly early to repeat the endoscopy. The quality indicator number two is sickle intubation rates. 
By sickle intubations, the definition is the passage of the tip of colonoscope beyond ileocecal valve. So it is not adequate to be standing in the middle of ascend, uh, descending, uh, ascending colon and take a picture of the ileocecal valve and the cecums. So you have to pass the tip of the colonoscope beyond the ileocecal valve, take a closer picture of the appendicular opening and also an uh, ileocecal opening. And if you manage to do ileo intubation, take a picture of the terminal ileums. So it is sh shown that High sickle intubation rate is associated with higher detection rate of adenoma and also less interval cancer. Uh, again, it is recommended by the task force to achieve at least 90% uh, of sickle intubation in all cases and perhaps 95% in screening cases. Quality indicator number three is the withdrawal time. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with this paper. Uh, this time is defined as a time from the arrival of the colonoscope at the cecum to when the scope is withdrawn from the anus. So adequate time of at least six minutes has been recommended by many, many societies. So th this is quite some time already. The recently there's a paper that looked into this as, as well. Basically, the calculation of time is better in, in, in this study. Basically, they use the negative study to, to assess the mean withdrawal times. So it is uh, shown that examining time at least six minutes is adequate, but beyond 10 minutes is, uh, is also not, uh, it doesn't confer significant increase in ADR. So there's no point staying examining the colon for at least huh, the 30 minutes and above. There's no point to do that. So six to 10 minutes, perhaps. Quality indicator number four is very important. This is the adenoma detection rate. The APP here is adenoma per participants. I'll, I'll come to that later. So adenoma detection rate was inversely associated with the risk of interval colorectal cancer more advanced cancer and colorectal cancer mortality. So it is said that even 1% increase in ADR decreased mortality by 5%. There are some modified adenoma detection rate uh, um, markers such as uh, APP adenoma per positive participant or some people call it adenoma per colonoscopy may be a better quality indicator. This is because there's a concern that endoscopies may not look hard for other polyps once a polyp is detected knowing that they have already contributed to this uh, ADR. However, data is lacking. So uh, let's look at this data. Basically show you that for every quintile increase in the ADR, there is significant proportion of decrease in the hazard ratio for interval colorectal cancer, for advanced stage colorectal cancer, and also uh, fat fatal colorectal cancer diagnosis. So what actually contribute to interval cancers? Is it due to the new lesions, incomplete resection from previous colonoscopy or missed lesion? So this study tells us that most of it comes from missed lesions. So what kind of lesion do we miss? So most of it are actually small, small lesions, 1 to 5 mm. So what are our benchmark? A benchmark is the uh, US uh, Society Task Force suggests that in 2002, it was 25% in men and more than 15% in, uh, in, in, in women. But uh, in 2014, this figure is revised to more than 30% in men and more than 20% in women. And uh, in, fecal, in a fecal or cow blood positive uh, patients, this figure has to be 15% higher, i.e. 45% uh, in men, 35% in women. This is the basic. Quality indicator number five is the documentation or endoscopic findings. In this uh, US uh, color colonoscopy reporting and data system, which is reported in 2007, they suggest that we should use a standardized descriptors for colonic polyps because clear communication of finding is key determinant of risk status and subsequent follow-up. So what are these descriptors? So they are location, morphology, size, method of removal, and completeness of removal and retrieval. So victims such as large or small should be avoided try to give estimations of size. Similar things. And in the European guidelines, uh, they also propose the same things, but what is slightly different is the addition of prediction of histology. This is the so-called endoscopic diagnosis or optical diagnosis. But do we really adhere to this guideline? So this uh, systemic review looking at this and basically show us that the adherence is generally poor especially when reporting the polyp size and morphology. What is the potential explanation for that? 
perhaps the perceived importance of these metrics is, 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 is low and a variable contribution to policies to surveillance practice, perhaps, and uh, also perhaps they feel that reporting uh, all these metrics are too burdensome. So I want to come to uh, each of it, the morphology and size. Why, why is it important? Because morphology and size help you predict advanced histology and metachronous neoplasia. It is also important for determination of therapeutic strategy and surveillance interval. Sorry, number three. Basically, uh, this help you to uh, predict histology. Yeah. Number four, location of lesions is important because uh, it helps you uh, to survey so that uh, after you resect, you know where to look for it, such as to look for residual recurrence. You also, uh, if there is complications, you can uh, accurately treat the complication knowing the locations. Endoscopic diagnosis is also very important, but it's not typically performed. It affects treatment strategy. If there is disagreement with pathology, you further biopsy may be needed if endoscopy suspicion is strong. For example, if you feel that there is a neoplastic process uh, in the lesions, but pathologists tell you it's a benign lesion, you, you may want to seriously uh, uh, repeat the biopsy again. Intervention is also important. Documented intervention is important for monitoring. The methods of removal, are you doing cold, cold, uh, cold polypatomy or hot polypatomy, forcep or snare, whether you completely resect it or partially resect it, whether it is uh, resected in on block fashion or piecemeal fashions, whether it is retrieved for histopathology examination or not. In our region publication by the MB Group, uh, in our statement file, we uh, strongly recommend that colonoscopy findings should be well documented. And in, in, in the statement, we, we stated that location, size, morphology, optical diagnosis, interventions should be documented and images captured. Quality indicator number six is the complication rates. As you all know that, uh, uh, we know that the, for screening colonoscopy, the perforation rate is about this 0.05. Bleeding around 0 0.3, mortality rate is very low. So this serves as an indicator. And uh, there are also legal implications to these events, and documentation is of paramount importance. So in summary, these are the three main domains uh, for quality indicators. And uh, these quality indicators serve to ensure high-quality colonoscopy. This, in return, uh, serve as an effective and safe colorectal cancer prevention tool and confers patients uh, a better patient outcome. With that, I thank you. This is an image of a Penang Hill in Penang uh, and also overlooking the Georgetown, which is the sister city of Adelaide. And I end with a promotional slide to encourage all of you to attend APDW and KL. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ho. We'll uh, reserve the questions to the end of the, um, the last session. Now, we know Professor Raju can't be here today, so we're going to have his presentation uh, screened to us anyhow. Uh, greetings. Uh, this is uh, Raju. Uh, from the University of uh, Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. I've been uh, looking forward to this trip to Australia to be with you all and uh, be part of this great course. I'm uh, very sorry I cannot make it in person and I look forward to learning from the very best in the field during this course. Thank you, Raj, Phil, and Norio. So my topic today is uh, dysplasia in IBD. How do you detect it, characterize it, and resect it? I'm not an expert in this field, so I requested the slide set from my good friend, Roy Setekno who has done a lot of great work 
along with uh, Tanya Kaltenbach, Ken McQuaid, and Sylvia. So I'm using these slides and made some modifications to best fit for this uh, lecture. Let me take you back and share with you what we used to do when I was a fellow in training in the early 1990s. At that time, we realized that it is important to do surveillance examination for patients with long-standing disease, especially those with pancolitis, either from ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, with a duration of 8 to 10 years. That's when we started doing colonoscopy. That stands true even today. The only difference from what we do today is that at that time, we used to take random biopsies, four quadrants, every three to seven centimeters, starting from the cecum all the way to the distal part of the rectum. So when you ask about what is the impact of this surveillance method using multiple biopsies of the colon, I will take you through a case. Here is a patient where biopsies were done. Biopsies came back as nothing remarkable. And then down the road, the patient developed colon cancer, as you can see here. The biopsies did miss the lesion that you have seen here. That's the area that should have been biopsied but the biopsy went a little bit further up and then that was missed and the patient ended up with cancer. So there is a problem with targeted biopsies. I would like to take you through a turning point in the surveillance of patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis. And this was the effort of a family, the Maxine and and Zach Zaro Family Foundation and William Karen Foundation. This family lost one of their loved ones and reached out to Roy Sitikno to come up and help do a better job. Roy, working with Ken McWade, former president of the ASGE, and his colleague, Tanya Kaltenbach, invited several experts from all over the United States, as well as in the rest of the world, and brought them together to develop the scenic international consensus statement on surveillance and management of dysplasia in inflammatory bowel disease. This was published both in GIE and gastroenterology way back in 2015. I would like to review this uh, document because this, uh, this forms the basis for what we do today. So what did we learn? We learned that dysplasia in IBD takes to a different form. That is more flat lesions than protruding lesions and random biopsies are not very good. They detect dysplasia in about nine out of 100 patients. In contrast, they've shown that if you use chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsies, the yield jumps up significantly to the tune of over 90 out of 100. So we're going to talk about chromoendoscopy in the next few slides. It's also interesting to note that in this large analysis of eight colonoscopy studies, including over 700 patients, the numbers needed to treat to find a patient with at least one dysplasia is 14. So the yield is pretty good. So this is what we should be doing in 
managing our patients with long term ibd so how do we screen ibd in 2020 the first step is excellent bowel preparation patient should be instructed about taking a low residue diet and take all the prep on the same day of the procedure 4 to 6 hours before the procedure or doing a split dose the first dose the evening before and the second dose 4 to 6 hours before the procedure time we should stay away from the single overnight dose with a long waiting period of 10 to 12 hours before the procedure because that does not give good preparation the next step is when you use an endoscope you should learn about the iris mode there are two modes the peak mode and the average slash auto mode the auto mode provides excellent view especially the long view but when you go close up it can create halation which limits your ability to detect and when you cl- come close up you should change to a peak mode peak mode so that you avoid the halation and have a great close up view this is a concept that you should keep in mind the next step is having a cap at the end of the scope helps you detect lesions that are across the bend as you can see here on the left versus the right the cap actually allows to flatten the fold and gives you the ability to recognize that coming to the chroma endoscopy we all struggle to come up with the right uh, mixture and this is the best slide that you should keep in mind or maybe take a photograph now if you want to for detection or surveillance exam exam you put two ampules of either indigo carmine or methylene blue if indigo carmine is not available in 250 ml of water and you could use water jet to actually flush and examine the colon when you find a lesion that you think that there is possibility that there is a lesion and you want to have a detailed viewing then you use a little more concentrated solution you add one ampule of indigo carmine in 25 cc of water and you get a much darker solution it will define the borders much better in contrast to these stronger dilutions for submucosal injection we use a very light dilution 10 drops in 100 cc of saline so that you could see the letters on the back side of the syringe so this is something to keep in mind i would like to next share with you a beautiful video produced by roy sotekno tanya kaltenbach and ken mcwade a chromo endoscopy with targeted biopsies first whenever possible the disease should be in remission before surveillance is undertaken active colitis causes changes in mucosal color texture and vascularity that can be extremely difficult to distinguish from non-polypoid neoplasia. Furthermore, mucosal inflammation and regeneration can cause cytological changes that can mimic dysplasia. An excellent bowel prep is a prerequisite for IVD surveillance. Suboptimal preps may obscure non-polypoid lesions. All remaining residue should be meticulously washed. After complete insertion of the colonoscope, Examination with chromoendoscopy begins in the cecum and proceeds methodically. During withdrawal, each segment is sprayed and carefully inspected. Excess indigo carmine solution is suctioned so that a thin layer remains and the mucosa is not obscured by blue pools. 
Lesions seen on chromoendoscopy are examined in closely to determine their border and their endoscopic resectability. This is a patient with quiescent UC undergoing routine surveillance. A slightly elevated lesion is poorly visualized with high definition imaging in a region involved with colitis. Upon application of dilute indigo carmine, a large flat neoplasm is well seen, which has discrete margins, and it appears to be much larger than initially predicted by white light imaging. The lesion was felt to be endoscopic resectable and was removed with ESD. Histology confirmed low-grade dysplasia. Endoscopists with less experience in EMR or ESD may consider referral to a more experienced endoscopist or to a surgeon after patient discussion. In contrast to the prior case, this lesion has several features that indicate that it is not endoscopically resectable. It's poorly circumscribed, has an indistinct border, and has an irregular plaque-like surface with a depressed center. Biopsies confirmed high-grade dysplasia. Surgery is the best treatment. In addition to enhancing the border, chromoendoscopy makes it easier to examine the mucosal surface of lesions. Under high-definition imaging, endoscopists can discriminate between inflammatory polyps, serrated lesions, and lesions with low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, or invasive cancer. It is unnecessary to biopsy or remove obvious inflammatory polyps or lesions, such as seen here. But, when in doubt, biopsies are recommended of all suspicious lesions to exclude dysplasia. This 35-year-old male with indeterminate colitis had a one-centimeter polypoid lesion within a colitic area. Biopsies excluded dysplasia and confirmed chronic inflammation. In this patient with long-standing chronic UC, dilute indigo carmine demonstrates a large, well-defined sessile lesion. The surface shows familiar features that resemble an adenoma. This lesion was removed by EMR and confirmed to have low-grade dysplasia. In this patient with chronic colitis, two well-demarcated, slightly raised lesions are readily identified. On close-up view, the lesion resembles a villus adenoma. The lesions also were resected with EMR and confirmed high-grade dysplasia. Non-polypoid lesions occurring within clitic areas may be removed endoscopically provided they are well circumscribed and do not have features suggesting obvious cancer with local invasion. Whenever possible, non-polypoid lesions less than two centimeters in size should be resected in one piece, i.e. on block, using EMR. Following a resection, the mucosa around the site should be biopsied to exclude the presence of unrecognized flat dysplasia which would usually require subsequent definitive surgical resection. In this patient with chronic colitis, a sessile lesion was identified with chromoendoscopy at six o'clock. Upon closer inspection, this sessile lesion was felt to have features suspicious for invasive malignancy. That is, the center of the lesion is depressed and the surface is amorphous with loss of mucosal detail. Hence, decisions pertaining to endoscopic versus surgical resectability were deferred pending biopsy results. Biopsy should be targeted at the most concerning area of the lesion as shown here, which confirmed invasive cancer. Surgical resection demonstrated a T1 and 0. So let's talk about uh, some of the limitations of chromoendoscopy. Uh, this can be a problem when you're looking at patients with a segment of colon with multiple large pseudopolyps and in patients with a stricture in the setting of ulcerative colitis. So let me show you some examples. Here is a segment with multiple pseudopolyps, and in this segment it is very hard to figure out if there is an associated dysplastic lesion in the surrounding area. Another example of a, a stricture in the colon, and hard to figure out whether the area that's abnormal is actually ongoing inflammation or development of a dysplastic pathology. So these are the limitations. So for the sake of uh, trainees here, 
what are the resources that are available and uh, let me ta- take a few minutes to talk about it i recommend highly to go back and get this uh, document the scenic international consensus statement on surveillance and management of dysplasia in inflammatory bowel disease published in gi endoscopy in 2015 and this is a great resource with several tables about how to take care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease there are also excellent resources on the ASGE online learning center dr sitekno boysitekno created this beautiful dvd on chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsy to detect non polypoid colorectal neoplasia in the setting of ibd so he also has put in other resources that you could access i would also urge you to listen to this beautiful uh, tip uh, the video tip of the week uh, from dr doug rex on chromo endoscopy in ibd surveillance this is a beautiful uh, video and you will learn a lot in conclusion uh, we have come a long way from random biopsies of the colon every few centimeters transitioning to chromo endoscopy with targeted biopsies and uh, we also recognize the ibd patients tend to have flat lesions and the man- and the management of these lesions should follow the new scenic recommendations i want to thank you all for this uh, opportunity and i also want to take a few minutes to pray for all those who have been affected by the severe fire in australia has been going on for the last few days thank you okay we'll move on now to uh rick brown Um, comes to us from Melbourne. Um, Greg was well known to most of the uh, of us um, as he's fairly been fairly active in the gastro society, and he's on the uh, conjoint committee. He's the chairman of the committee at the moment. So he's going to te- tell us about cusnear polypectomy tips, tricks, and evidence. Thank, thank you, you Gary, and thanks, Raj, for asking me to take part in this fantastic symposium. Now, I gave a similar talk yesterday. This is a little more condensed. I apologise to those who um, heard some of the themes and saw, have seen some of the slides, but I am going to go through a bit more evidence at the uh, at the end of uh, towards the end. So I'm going to talk a bit about technique, tips and tricks, and then look at some of the evidence around cold snare. Um, so the rationale of cold snare is transecting the polyp using the snare wire alone. It's really a big biopsy and we talked yesterday about how that has implications for how you might use this technique in the anticoagulated patient. It does eliminate the risk of thermal injury, which I think most of us recognise and agree is, a, while it has benefits, also has risk, particularly in terms of delayed bleeding. Uh, and perforation but it may come cold snare at the cost of increased immediate bleeding and cold snare has been around for a long time it was first described uh, almost 30 years ago the the advantages of cold snare are that it is quick it is cheap it is safe and we'll look at that it's effective and for small polyps you get an on-block specimen You do need to um think about what snare you're going to use and I'll really just focus on the lower snares which are the more modern dedicated or semi-dedicated cold snares. Um on the right is the Exacto, in the middle is the Olympus uh, hot cold and then on the left is the Boston um Captivator cold snare. So the, the middle one does have potential for diathermy but it is it is a cold snare and the other two have no capacity for diathermy whatsoever the truly dedicated cold snares the wires on cold snares tend to be stiffer and finer so they cut through and importantly also the catheters and sorry that's often why they have a a diamond anvil configuration to maintain the shape but the catheters also are finer thinner than the normal the traditional um hot snare catheters and that has advantages in terms of suctioning uh, tissue up the channel beside them 
So the technique that I use, and we'll just go through this and then look at a quick video, is um, ask for the cold snare and at that point in, in where I work regularly, the, the assistants know to put a trap on because they know we're going to do a polypectomy and they know it'll come up the channel and they've got to catch it. Um, I ask the assistant to open the snare and um, different snares uh, behave in different ways but in general when you open, the, you open the snare fully and then retract slightly so that there are no parallel wires between the open part of the snare wire and the catheter. Um, and we like to work, we should work close to the tip of the scope because then that gives you much more accurate apposition to, on the tissue. It also allows you to use the tip of the scope to depress a fold if you're working over a fold so that you can have a good field of view. You've got to centre the polyp in the open snare and you must take a rim of normal tissue and more is better. You really can't take too much with a cold snare. It's just so safe. Then I ask the assistant to close and I keep the tip down. So this is very important, you know, I think in the early days of cold snare we were used to hot snaring where we like to tent the mucosa to protect the deeper tissues from diathermy. But you don't need to worry about that with cold snare and if you do that what you will find of course is as soon as it cuts through the piece flicks off into the distance and then you've got to spend time finding it. Whereas if you leave the tip of the snare in the defect as it closes the, the piece of polyp will remain in the defect and then is very easily suctioned and retrieved. I do ask the nurse to close to finger tight and then I like to check that I'm happy with the closure, that I've got enough tissue and I've got what I want and then I ask them to cut and they basically just fully close the snare and hold it firm. There's no seesawing or open closing, just hold it firm and usually with these thin wire dedicated cold snares that it cuts through smoothly and quickly um, and we'll talk about what to do if it doesn't. And then straight away I would suction the specimen into the trap. You don't need to take the catheter out. Almost always, although we got caught out of it yesterday, but generally if you can cut it with a cold snare, a 10 millimetre or less cold snare, it'll come up beside the snare, up the channel of an adult colonoscope, which is a 3.7 uh, millimetre channel. Not true of a paediatric colonoscope necessarily. Check the defect, make sure you've got it all. You can irrigate the defect with the foot pump and often uh, swell it up with a sort of, not a submucosal, but an intramucosal injection. And if in doubt, if you're not sure about a margin, just cut it again. Keep cutting until you're confident. So this is, these are pictures from David Hewitt's paper with Doug Rex 10 years ago now and illustrating those issues, particularly top right, centering the polyp, press the flesh, press the wire down, particularly the heel uh, of the snare uh, here, it needs to be set well into the tissue, that allows the, the wire to grab normal mucosa with the polyp tissue centred so that you get uh, complete resection. Now this is, we'll see if the video plays, yes. So these are just a couple, this is the exacto cold snare, you know, moving target, tricky. I would actually, you know, I think that was margin, only just enough margin, I wouldn't be really happy with that and if I was concerned I could cut again. And again, moving target, we can see on scope guide we're up under the heart here in the distal transverse, getting plenty of normal tissue. And using the point of the, the snare, if it's not an easy spot, you can use the embed the tip of the snare and then pivot around that to bring it to where you want it to be if, the, if, it's not, if you aren't able to easily get the polyp into the six o'clock position. If it won't cut through, um, which was more of a problem with the traditional hot snares when used for cold snare because the wires are thicker. Um, the key thing is to maintain snare closure and be patient. Usually it will cut. If it doesn't, we straighten the catheter outside of the scope gently and this, as much as possible the scope inside the patient uh, because that slightly shortens the wire relative to the catheter and can give you that last little bit of pressure to cut through the tissue. We can pull back gently to put a bit of traction on the polyp and then one can release and regrip. In The problem we have here when the snare is stalled is not the mucosa, it is the submucosa. It's the connective tissue of the submucosa form, mucosa forming a nubbin and it's all trapped. So by releasing slightly the, um, the nubbin can drop out and the mucosectomy can be completed. If none of that works then I use what we call a crop technique and of this video, oh sorry. Which really is we close, if it doesn't um, cut through, we retract the snare catheter into the channel. we we'll see in a moment, we pull it in. It's still not cutting, we're waiting, we've been patient, very patient for me. 
and then what I'm asking the DERS to do at that point is open the snare with avulsing the polyp on the end of the scope and by opening the, sca the snare the submucosal nubbin that you can see there drops out of the snare and allows the mucosectomy to be completed. If it's happening, if the, the final thing to say, if, it's hap if uh, your snare is stalling repeatedly, is if you may have done a few cold snares in the one patient and the wires fatigue, then you might need to get a new snare. If you're worried about incomplete polypectomy, you keep cutting till you get it all. We've talked about that. Bleeding is almost always capillary ooze. And if you want to, you can wait, and it usually stops. If it persists, or I think if it's arterial or arteriola, then I would manage it with a clip. And the final point we've talked about, don't take the snare out. You can usually suction past, and that way if you're doing multiple polypectomies, it's much more efficient, because you're not having to pull the snare out and put it back in all the time. Cold snare is very safe for small polyps. With this, um, you know, enormous numbers of small polyps in enormous numbers of patients, and no delayed bleeding or perforation. And that, that's old data, but I think that absolutely replicates the experience um, with cold snare around the world, anecdotally. We know it's also effective for small polyps. This is a study we did at Alfred uh, a few years ago where we uh, did traditional snare as a traditional hot snare. It was the Olympus um, 10 millimetre, either the stiff or the, um, the soft snare, the 0.4 millimetre wire snare. And then the dedicated cold snare was an exacto snare. And looking at complete resection primarily and showing no difference and very high levels of complete resection by margin biopsy. And while there was a, a small amount of immediate bleeding, there was no delayed bleeding and no perforation. And at that time, when I think we're still getting our heads around this, the incomplete resection rate was more for serrated lesions than adenomas. And I think now we're much better at making sure we get it all and checking the defects. So I think an interesting area is where how we take cold snare into larger polyps. And um, I think you know, we saw some lovely cases yesterday of that. Uh, we have some data to support that uh, from uh, David Hewitt and Nick Tatucci in Brisbane. They looked at, uh, I'll show you that, about 170 odd polyps. They lifted them, and uh, these are all SSPs, importantly, uh, lifted them all and um, piecemeal cold snared, including the margin. Then they biopsied the margin. They had a 30 day follow up call, and then they did surveillance on the majority of them. And in these 162 polyps, some of which, many of which were what I would call moderate, half of them were 10 to 19 millimetres rather than large, um, but only two patients had positive margin biopsies and only one patient um, had at SC1 or first surveillance colonoscopy had um, a residual visible polyp uh, and about 80% of them had been checked. Um, there was a little bit of one early bleed requiring clips. I wouldn't consider that a complication. One admission for abdominal pain, no delayed beads, no perforations. So that's very encouraging and has since been published. This is some data from our group with um, Alan Moss uh, looking at comparing um, hot snare and cold snare. That, you can tell from the p-values there that these aren't the same polyps and that is a, a problem. This is a retrospective study. It's not a randomised study. but Nevertheless, um, there were certainly complications with hot snare and again, there were none with cold snare. And we're looking at a lot of polyps, hundreds of polyps. So now I just want to finally talk about some very recent data, again, coming uh, mainly from Alan Moss and um, Moss's group at Western Hospital. Uh, Dilip is his uh, fellow doing his PhD. He was our fellow before he went to Western and we contributed data to this uh, work which really was looking at this question of can we use cold snare EMR for large adenomatous polyps, um, sessile polyps, and showing that yes, it appears that we can. So there were over 200 polyps looked at, um, and, and oh, I've got the wrong side, but about 80% of them had SC1, so check at four to six months. And of those that were normal, another 70% had SC2 check. So quite a significant follow up. And in this group of patients, dedicated cold snare EMR, only 5.5% recurrent rates at SC1. So that is comparable with the ACE study randomised outcomes of um, snare tip coagulation to reduce the recurrence rate of adenomas from 20% to 5%. So this is all comers. And the safety was uh, excellent. Um, 
there were 3.8% had clinically significant post-polypectomy bleeds, so that means they were admitted, but all of those were managed conservatively, and one patient had unexplained abdominal pain requiring admission but uh, got better without scans. I just want to show you this data, drill down into the data from this a bit and show you that um, while most of the polyps were serrated, a significant proportion were not, were adenoma, but the interesting observation, which is not significant on the right-hand side, that the, the recurrence rate at SC1 for or first colonoscopy at four to six months for serrated polyps was only 3.7%, and for tubular adenoma it was, it was roughly twice that at 7.5%, and for tubular villus adenoma, again, 14%. So very suggestive and very consistent with my own and others' observations and concerns about where cold snare is going to end up in the, in the sessile adenoma place and that I think the bulkier, uh, more villous lesions are not going to be the ones that we're using cold snare for. So there we are, that's the discussion. So dedicated cold snares with good technique allow efficient routine polypectomy and really should be part of your routine practice. If you're still doing hot biopsy, don't get onto this. Uh, cold snare is very safe and very effective for small polyps and it has an emerging role for the large sessile polyps. There's no, no doubt for serrated lesions and increasingly for adenomas, particularly granular adenomas, so the very flat adenomas, not so much the big bulky uh, 1S villus lesions. I think that is all. Yeah. <laughs>
pre-resection uh, imaging is important. Uh, before you like to take something off, spend a few seconds looking at it. Um, and I did uh, mention yesterday that we will go through the Paris classification. I know this can be boring to all of you, but you know sometimes it helps that if we've got this information in our reports. Um, and uh, you know that a pedunculated polyp is a pedunculated pedunculated polyp 1P, perhaps on the Paris classification, and a sessile polyp uh, is uh, um, looking like this, almost like the AS rock, but uh, this this is a diameter of a biopsy forceps. Uh, it's 2.5 millimeters. You're not going to put a biopsy forceps next to the polyp and then measure it. Of course, you're going to eyeball it, but you know you, you get the idea that it's a little bit more bulkier than you would probably classify it as a 1S lesion. And if it's a little bit more flatter, it's a, one, a 2A. And uh, completely flat, I think, depends on the level of insufflation. So um, sometimes uh, you can uh, you can actually uh, sort of uh, deflate the bubble and you find that it's actually a 2A lesion. And uh, when it's 2C, then you have to be a bit more worried because there's certainly uh, evidence that there's increased risk of submucosal invasion. And granularity is the other thing. So this is just looking at um, the granularity of lesions, looking at how the surface structure is. You can see it's nodular over here, but this generally this whole lesion is granular. And of course, this is non-granular, uh, meaning that it's kind of flat. And this obviously is non-granular and it's looking like a cancer. But the thing is that uh, granularity can give you, give you more information with regards to submucosal invasion. And this is almost 10 years ago now. Uh, the study started in 2008 or 9, if I'm not mistaken, when we first uh, started. And um, uh, it does help just not looking at uh, focal interrogation, not looking at all this NBI and all these different classifications. If you just look at granularity and the Paris classification. Uh, initially, the Paris classification, a 2A lesion has got a risk of about 2 to 3 percent. When it's nodular, the risk increases, you know, when it's sessile. When it's mixed, uh, in, in, it also increases a little bit more, 13 percent. And when it's depressed, it's about 46 percent. When you add uh, granularity to it, you would see that a non-granular 2AC lesion has got a risk of submucosal invasion of about 67 percent. So, you're not applying any fancy imaging, you're just looking at the lesion and um, you know you basically spend a few ad additional seconds just trying to understand what's happening there. Okay, once you've got that um, on board, then you're going to focally interrogate and uh, press some of those buttons at the, uh, on your left hand um, and uh, divide these polyps uh, as we discussed yesterday into three types. You may want to sort of uh, work it out a little bit more and uh, expand it because SSA kind of sits in, in no man's land in the NICE classification and you may want to uh, consider if you uh, switch on NBI perhaps you can see this uh, mucus cap cloud-like appearance wavy uh, pits which we discussed yesterday um, and uh, if the lesion is a little bit more intense then uh, you have to consider if you want to subject this lesion to an endoscopic resection or you simply have to take a biopsy. Uh, and you can get more information from this uh, uh, classification if you want to. Um, you can email me as well. So this is in my mind what I would do. Uh, this sort of lesion, subject them to an endoscopic resection, a 2-2-O, which is an SSA-like lesion, or a 3-A, and lesions which are in the other category, 3B, then you'll probably either want to biopsy it or further interrogate it. Uh, so these are sort of type 3 lesions. Uh, you immediately know there's something else going on there. It's not only in the colon, it can be anywhere in the GI tract that perhaps this is submucosally invasive. And I showed this yesterday um, as well, uh, a polyp which you may want to just put a snare, take it off, but look carefully because this central area here has got you know, um, as I said, there's demarcation line and there's demarcation line also in the in the colon, I think. And um, this is totally avascular, uh, so not avascular, amorphous pit pattern. And uh, a biopsy is taken from this area of obviously uh, showed that this is an invasive cancer. So this was going to the MP. So if you would take this off, uh, uh, good luck. Um, you know, things can go wrong. So if you're still not sure, the Japanese do this, and uh, they they put a bit of chromoendoscopy. It, it's quite interesting, actually, and, and you can look at the pit patterns. So you don't really look at the vascularity anymore. You look at the pit patterns. 
So for instance, uh, this polyp has got two different morphologies. The side of the polyp is, is a TVA, but the tip of the polyp, you can see the, the pattern is slightly irregular compared to that, but um, it's not destroyed. So uh, the tip of the lesion has got some evidence of uh, perhaps uh, superficially submucosally invasive cancer. And when you see this sort of lesion, you may want to consider if you need to take this off in an end block fashion, rather than cutting that half into two, uh, and that will make a pathological interpretation impossible. And uh, this is a lesion which looks probably simple enough, obviously it's in the cecum, but you know, lift, cut, lift, cut, lift, cut, it should be all right. But um, if you look again, again, spend a couple additional seconds, don't take biopsies from here, all right, but just look at the center, all right, there's a devoid uh, pit pattern and, and uh, the vascularity is all over the place. This is a bit of chromoendoscopy and that, that is actually an invasive uh, component of the, the lesion, so you wouldn't want to resect this endoscopically. Um, sometimes some additional signs may help. It's not all about looking at the lesion, uh, you know, just looking at, uh, at the tree and forgetting the forest. Um, perhaps you should look at it from afar. And, uh, you know, there was this uh, non-distendable -distend sign which Noria uh, put forth, and, and that sometimes can help you, you know. The, the, some lesions which are submucosally invasive, they don't really distend as well. They're not loose on the mucosa. They, they're kind of stuck. And you, you know when you see it, though. The question is how do you describe it, I suppose. So, for instance, this is a cancer. Um, and uh, you know it's 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 kind of just pinned down to the wall. You may think it's uh, or one may think that this is pedunculated, but actually part of it at the back is stuck to the wall. So you wouldn't want to take this off. Sometimes, as I said, you can see a demarcation line. Quite interestingly, even with white light, you don't need any fancy uh, sort of scopes, and it bleeds easily to touch. That's the other thing, which can point you towards uh, something more sinister occurring. Uh, some have suggested perhaps this uh, chicken skin appearance. This was quite fancy when it first came out. Uh, and when it first came out, uh, we, we, we all got uh, sort of excited that uh, perhaps this is an early sign of uh, cancer. So as a result, you know, you can see this quite clearly here with uh, narrow band imaging and magnification. As a result um, uh, of this chicken skin appearance, uh, we decided to take this off uh, in an end block fashion using ESD and then uh, later on we, we sort of uh, found out that um, it's actually of no use. So it's just lipid droplets so I, I wouldn't worry too much if you see it. Okay, so just to let you know, so it, you know, it, it was quite interesting initially and quite a fancy name as well, chicken skin, but, <laughs> but it's of no use. Um, I, I do think sometimes you see this uh, sort of string of bead appearance. Uh, so it's not only this uh, uh, amorphous uh, pattern uh, or avascular pattern. You sometimes see this this new vessel formation. And if you look harder, it looks like little beads uh, being strung together. So this is an earlier example of, of the case I told you about the non-granular depressed lesion. And if you look at the, um, at the center of the lesion, the whole area is obviously fairly distorted, but you can see this sort of uh, bead-like appearance in some of these vessels. I think this helps. Of, of course, it's not described again. And we did discuss about this as well. So we know about the overt lesions. We, we, you know, we see some of these lesions, kudos type 3 or 4, nice type 2. Um, you know, like yesterday's case, yes, this, this, we know that these are lesions which we can actually uh, subject them to. Uh, and EMR, but occasionally, as we discussed yesterday, there are some covert lesions, so we think it looks okay, looks okay on the surface, but it comes back as a submucosally invasive cancer, and, and this sort of lesion sometimes need an end block resection, and uh, Mike's the group as well has looked at this uh, fairly well, and um, I know Gregor um, have been looking at this uh, subgroup of patients with submucosally invasive cancer, which we are part of as well, and um, I think there are going to be some very interesting results coming out. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, good to know that uh, you have to be a little bit more cautious if the lesion has got a sessile component, 
if it's non-granular and interestingly if it's more distal so the risk of some mucosal invasion increases so th these are covert sort of uh, lesions or cancers so we the surface looks fine but the inner inner part of the polyp does not so uh, we, we know about hot snare EMRs. Um, you know this. Uh, uh, we've seen some examples yesterday. Uh, it's uh, basically a standard resect and cut sort of technique. This is uh, almost a circumferential lesion. We we inject and we cut. We don't inject the whole lesion. So um, I won't go through this in detail as to how to do this. But uh, it's an inject and resect uh, method. The first resection is always disappointing. Looks small. But don't worry, um, carefully uh, being patient about it, you can get uh, the whole lesion out, uh, as in this case uh, here, uh, taking out the lesion and uh, checking the, the edges uh, fairly well. At this instance, we did not apply the ST, uh, SE method or the snare tip soft coagulation method because uh, we didn't think about it at that time. But um, you can get this sort of result. So large lesions can be resected fairly well. And uh, Gregor has uh, spoken about cold snare EMR. So hot snare EMRs are also, uh, I, as I said, um, capable of resecting fairly large lesions, almost circumferential, if not circumferential. Of course, uh, with the nuances in, in imaging, uh, we're now not very, I guess, afraid of, and the, the therapeutic methods which we have, uh, we're not very afraid of some of the complications. Um, you saw one yesterday. Uh, it's important to uh, uh, evaluate the base uh, once you have resected uh, a lesion and identify any issues and treat it. So uh, this classification was devised by Mike. Um, and you can see that if you've got a bit of circular muscle there, you may not want to treat it. The submucosa looks bluish, like, like a matte-like appearance there. Um, if you have got a a target sign then you have to worry of course this looks like a lesion this is in the ascending colon maybe about 23 24 millimeters um, again in the good old good old days uh, um, there was this uh, sort of hope that we can take this off all in one piece and you can see that the resection is carrying on beyond about maybe six seven seconds and as a result, the, the piece is out, but uh, the the base has got this uh, tiny perforation there. Um, interestingly, with perfs, you always tend to see a lot of blood as well. So if you're coming out after inserting a scope and you suddenly see a lot of blood, just be aware that something is not quite well there. So anyway, in this instance, uh, because we are able to sort of close this lesion uh, we, we did close it um, there was no contamination uh, there was a muscle defect and that was called a target sign and when you look at the um, the base of the lesion you'll find uh, what's called as a, a reverse target sign so um, the lesion obviously has uh, flown off somewhere else um, and and when you look at it you can see the reverse target sign there so that's that's important to identify during the procedure um, of course, when this happens, it's not very good. Um, so you don't do this every day, okay? So don't get the wrong uh, sort of information. Um, so this is a true and true perf. Um, uh, there's some pneumoperitoneum developing, and this patient actually developed a bit of subcutaneous emphysema. So we're using a, a sort of a water seal to, um, I think that pressing is unnecessary, but just made me feel better. Um, and the bubbles are coming out. This was uh, once that was done, uh, and the patient was uh, stabilized. We, we then went on and and uh, sort of slowly clipped the the lesion um, close, as you can see there. So obviously one clip is never enough. Two maybe not. Um, you tend to put a little bit more in th those sort of instances. Um, so when you sometimes see an actual uh, hole uh, in in the uh, defect, if it's uh, if it's contaminated, then it's going to be an issue. So these are just some learning points uh, with regards to complications. I know Andrew covered a little bit of it yesterday. Um, this this again was a granular um, lesion. It uh, it's in the cecum. 
lifted fairly well. I was quite happy with the lift. Um, and then used uh, a snare, uh, again, 20 mm snare, um, and uh, got the, the margins fairly well. But you will see that uh, as we close it and try to cut it, it, it didn't sort of uh, cut through. So in that instance, it's always good to release the snare, all right, because uh, beyond three seconds, you're not going to keep going, right? So you, you release the snare and try to recapture part of the lesion. Um, so I'm not happy there. It was uh, the actual cautery started a little bit later there. So I released the snare and then try to capture perhaps about 60% of it, like that, and went on to then uh, keep cutting. So th the problem with this is that I didn't see the back edge, all right? So when you don't see that, this is what you get. Okay, so so that's okay. Uh, as you saw yesterday, we, we could deal with it, uh, with, with the clips which we have. Unfortunately for this patient, the IC valve decided to get involved in, in that, quarrel I guess and it basically contaminated the the outside so it's okay um, the, the patient was uh, well enough we, we just uh, closed it that's the reverse target sign there we, we clipped it um, and then what we went on to do is to uh, uh, get the patient arranged for a surgery because there was still part of the polyp which was not resected but since the the peritoneum was contaminated. I decided that it's best that the patient go on and have surgery, which the patient did the next day because it was so stable that um, they planned it electively. Sometimes you can have this sort of lesions. Um, this looks like a tubular villus adenoma. We lift it and then uh, we resect it. We see a lot of blood. We get worried and then uh, start clipping it and then you find this yellowish material. Again, uh, we we didn't have much of an inclination in uh, earlier on, but uh, these these are actually this is actually submucosal fat which you tend to see in the right colon. Um, and I I thought that was a target sign, uh, so obviously not very happy with that view, and closed it up, and then we found out that uh, this uh, adenoma was on a lipoma. So again, you, you find this weird and wonderful sometimes, which you know led us to believe it's a false positive target sign. We can also prevent recurrence, and again, involved in this uh, study, which uh, you saw, you saw part of. You saw Gregor doing this yesterday, and uh, we did this for the other polyp yesterday as well, where we sort of uh, burn the edges, if you may, with um, this native soft coagulation method. So uh, 80 watts effect four uh, using the soft coag method. Uh, it works fairly well, you just need to get a bit of the tip of the scope, uh, tip of the snare outside the scope. Um, I would say use a 15 millimeter braided snare. Don't use the thin wire snares because the, the coagulation is not as good. So if you want to use a, a proper snare to do this nicely like this, you should use a, a braided snare. You'll get that sort of nice effect. Um, and it's shown that, you know, I did mention earlier, re recurrence rates 10 to 20 percent. It's come down quite drastically with this uh, randomized uh, control study. And then we can uh, these days see recurrence. And I showed you briefly that uh, these are some of the images you can get uh, with no recurrence versus recurrence. So uh, color uh, pits and vascular, color pits and vascular pattern as well. Um, and this is uh, in press. This is uh, just uh, a video of uh, how this is done. Um, I, I don't think you need to uh, sort of uh, biopsy these lesions, uh, but you know this is just our experience. Uh, I think this will be published sometime uh, in the next few months. But you can actually see that uh, it's a pale sort of appearance there, and uh, this is uh, in keeping with a scar. In contrast, obviously, uh, with a little bit of uh, fluid um, that that obviously looks like a diminutive adenoma there and you want to take that off uh, we find more and more scars these days so we, we found very high uh, negative predictive values uh, with this and i won't go through the details uh, we also uh, tested it or validated it with a few centers outside australia so uh, potential implications for this is that perhaps don't biopsy scars which 
does not have any features of uh, adenoma. If, if you're highly confident and treat scars uh, which has got, uh, of course, features of adenoma. And if you, you're lowly, if you have low confidence with regards to the scar, you probably should treat anyway. I'll just go through the full thickness resection device. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a device which uh, you basically uh, attach to the tip of the scope and you pull in this, this uh, mucosa, submucosa, and the muscularis propria, um, and then uh, put a sort of a padlock type clip, and then cut underneath. No, sorry, you should cut over it. If you cut underneath it, it'll be a disaster. All right, so don't, don't, don't uh, cut and then place the clip. Place the clip, then cut. All right, so that's very important. So you can actually see that there's a, a full thickness resection there. So uh, I think it's useful for sort of uh, lesions which are two centimeters and less, uh, recalcitrant, perhaps scarred previous attempts. Sometimes that's an issue. Some lesions which you think could be uh, harboring superficial uh, submucosal invasion, like the lesion I showed yesterday uh, in one of the slides, and um, patients who are pearl surgical candidates, perhaps. But th this is an interesting case: a diverticulum uh, with adenoma within the diverticulum. Um, very very tricky. It's it's uh, it's a nice uh, video looking at at that sign there. As you can see, the adenoma extends here, and we we pumping in a bit of water, uh, extends into the the neck of the diverticulum. This was in the transverse colon. Um, I, there's absolutely no way we're going to take that off um, with the conventional means. So we marked the the lesion with with cautery and then uh, carefully pulled it in. As you can see there, uh, applied um, the um, full thickness resection device and then uh, snared it off. And this is kind of the, the end result. You can obviously see the contents outside as well coming out. So uh, th I, this, is a, this is an interesting device and I, I think it does help with certain indications, careful indications. I'll quickly go through ESD. You, you already know and you've seen so many different... Uh, sort of uh, uh, images, you know, uh, large lesions like that can be carefully uh, cut around, some mucosal dissection, um, and then uh, you get this sort of uh, nice um, defect, uh, and you get uh, uh, an end block resection, which, which is important. We know that obviously the end block resection rate is going to be higher. I mean, this is a no-brainer, I suppose. The rates of recurrence lower with ESD compared to EMR, but perforation rates uh, about five to six percent, so it's pretty high. Obviously, it's lower in, with the Japanese uh, population, but it's still pretty high in the Western area. So we know about lesion assessment, but I'd just like to uh, take you to the uh, ESG guideline. So you may want to consider in the colon depressed morphology, non-granular surface pattern, and lesions more than two centimeter, which which is tr tricky, isn't it? I mean. Once the lesion is larger, it's going to be difficult to remove, I suppose. But depressed lesions and non-granular certainly has a higher risk of submucosal invasion. I'll just uh, tell you that we've got the special knives now, which helps us with injection and uh, resection. This is a fairly interesting uh, anal verge lesion, uh, which uh, basically uh, was fairly uh, straightforward to do. We uh, we can sometimes cut even on the squamous mucosa on the anal verge, which we did for this patient initially, and then retroflex the scope and started continuing with the dissection. There are lots of blood vessels, obviously, in this area, but it can be uh, easily sort of uh, dealt with, and this is the end result. So, um, you know, you get a good specimen. This was uh, a traditional serrated adenoma with uh, dysplasia interesting just at the anal verge you, we can use conical caps we can use the line and hook method which is a little bit uh, complex to show here but this can be used to sort of pull the lesion so that you can get to the submucosa and there's something called the pocket creation method where you kind of create a pocket underneath the lesion around it underneath and then start cutting the edges uh, which which is quite a nice technique and i won't show that Complications, again, bleeding is an issue. This is one of our er earlier days where, where we had this uh, sort of lesions. I mean, uh, these days, you know, you see that it's, it's okay. 
um, the uh, the blood is going away you put the choir grasper and you just work it out um, of course um, a few years ago that was kind of daunting so we can take this off and uh, Noria basically gave me a very nice suggestion he said that if you were to cut these lesions try to concentrate on the deeper aspect of the submucosa where you find thicker blood vessels where you can easily deal with this prophylactically rather than cutting it more superficially where you find lots of small tiny vessels and it keeps oozing and making the resection even more difficult this was an ESD this is in the stomach um, straightforward I think in 30 minutes we got it all off pretty good some muscle there happy with this patient went out and came back with this after an hour um, I just couldn't make I mean yeah it's just strange anyway so we found the oozing spot put some clips and then looking back maybe the bleeding spot was around here yeah perhaps you know so maybe you should have cauterized that or choreographed that a little bit but this occurred about uh, an hour after the ESD so these sort of things can happen in a delayed fashion and this is another example things were going well everything was good uh, complete resection all happy nice uh, sort of resection lots of fibrosis lots of bleeding had to deal with it but you know I'm sure Philip and Noria and George will tell you that something is not quite right here uh, th that's what's not quite right so you got these three little holes there so that's why it's important to train. It's difficult. Uh, you've got to observe cases and use animal models, pig models, whatever, um, and then slowly start off. In fact, in the stomach, which we do not have a lot of cases for rectum, we do have some cases for this. And then you move on to the esophagus. And finally, if you're speaking about the colon, it's right at the end there. The wall is so thin, there could be issues. So it's a long learning curve for ESDs so where does it fit in the colon then you know EMRs is so good now right we, we, we're doing most of this um, effortlessly but you know perhaps lesions which uh, has a, a suspicion of a submucosal invasion kudos type 5 depressed lesions non-granular uh, sessile perhaps in the rectosigmoid junction uh, area where the risk of uh, cancer or submucosal invasion is higher compared to the right colon once uh, things have been tackled with EMR repeatedly, maybe, but it's difficult, of course, and dysplasia and IBD perhaps because these things can be really pinned down and very difficult to resect. So in summary, I hope I've shown you uh, uh, some of the things which we can do, some of the nuances I, I hope of uh, EMR, um, ESD and FDR uh, imaging. Uh, Grego has uh, spoken about cold snare. Uh, so you may want to consider Colesner for SSAs, and there's some data coming out with regards to adenomas now. Um, hot EMR is capable of addressing the majority of lesions, uh, but you know, um, and it should not have any features of deep SMI though. And you want to consider that you have to evaluate the base of uh, the EMR defect for deep muscular injury and prevent recurrence with the snare tip soft coagulation method. And you can also then see recurrence when you bring these patients back, uh, just using simple push button techniques. And uh, ESD and FDR, newer techniques, careful case selection is important. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank Raj, Gregor, and Professor Ho for their talks. I think Raj is gonna progress on to answering some questions. Yeah. And directing them to the appropriate people. So there's uh, quite a few coming in. Um, so this is uh, directed to Gregor and uh, George. Um, can you comment on the SSP detection rate as a quality indicator? Do you, do you wanna? Is that working? It is. Um, I think it's better than ADR, but the evidence isn't there. I think if you're finding serrated lesions, then the um, adenomas are like dog's balls. So um, <laughs> that's where you've got to focus your efforts. Um, and recertification has recognised that. So as of this year, 
um, serrated detection rate is part of the recertification criteria. It's set at 5%, I think, which yes. is a bit low, but yeah. it's better than nothing. Yeah, so it's at 5%. Uh, interesting. I think Australia is the only country in the world who has uh, sort of mandated that for now. Can Five. I just, while I have the mic, just talk a little bit about dye spray yes. in IBD? And, um, because I think, it's, um, I think it's more controversial than Senec would have you believe, but um, I don't want to be too controversial, and Dr Raju is not here to defend himself, but yes. um, I think there have been studies since Senec which uh, cast doubt on the validity of dye spray in the setting of um, quality um, high-definition white light colonoscopy, um, and that um, I think if you're not confident in, your, in that, then sure, use dye spray, but I think in a well-prepared bowel, if you're careful, I think you can see most of it with white light, and I know without, again, I don't use dye spray. Anymore. But if you do want to use dye spray, can you show that slide that I? The um, ampules are really expensive of sterile um, indigo. Ster indigo is a food dye. I don't know if you knew that. Um, and so it's about fifty or sixty dollars an ample. And if you're going to use two ampules, that's one hundred and twenty bucks. If you're going to use a dye spray catheter, which is completely unnecessary in this setting, I think, then that's another hundred and eighty bucks. Whereas you can buy a kilo of indigo from this company, in which I have no shares, um, <laughs> and it costs about 250 bucks. And a kilo of indigo lasts approximately three million years. You use, <laughs> um, you use a quarter of a teaspoon for a litre of water, and um, so it's about 10 cents for a litre of water. So if you are going to do this, get your people to talk to Ravenswood, and they deliver it for 30 bucks. And it lasts forever. And I have, I used to, have, I don't do it anymore, but I used to have a little container that I would take around wherever I went and use that, a little quarter of a teaspoon in a litre of water with a bit of um, Infocol. Thanks, Gregor. That, that's very helpful. Um, so there's the, the, the few other questions here. Um, Gregor, do you, do you feel that there should be separate accreditation for advanced EMR? Yes, uh, accreditation. Um, gee, that's tricky, isn't it? Um, I mean, we don't even do accreditation for polypectomy, so why should we do accreditation for EMR? It's assumed. Yeah. Um, we, this was talked about yesterday, and um, I think there are two issues in advanced hot EMR, yes. in, well, hot EMR, uh, one is safety and one is adequacy. So you, if you're tackling bigger lesions, you've got to make sure you get them all, and that takes uh, training and expertise, but you also, you will have complications, you know. I mean, Raj has done thousands of these, and, and he had a perforation yesterday, which he managed beautifully, so it wasn't me, just for the record, it was Raj. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but he managed it beautifully, and, and yes, it's a complication, but, uh, you know, and the guy is in hospital, but he's going to be fine, and, um, and it was an enormous lesion, and it's vastly better than a proctocolectomy, which was what he was looking at, because it came pretty low, or maybe um, an ultra-low anterior resection. So I think... There should, I, I think, um, if you're going to tackle this stuff, I think you should be trained, and and I think you should do it um, in a in a proper hospital. It's not a day centre type um, procedure. Um, however, I think you know where depending where cold snare ends up in this space, uh, as we said yesterday, it is just so safe, um, even with very large lesions, that you know, that is something that can be done um, as long as you get it all. It, it takes out the risk thing of complications. It really comes back to adequacy of resection. And as long as you get it all, and you can, you're prepared to spend a bit of time doing it, um, you know, I, I think that's that's a fair game. Yes, and uh, it's always an issue, isn't it? How do you sort of uh, monitor this, and how do you monitor complication rates? I, I think. Uh, the resection adu adequacy and um, the complications uh, should be self-audited, you know, and you should keep information and data with regards to this. Um, that's really so, so important. It's not only in the colon, but everywhere. Uh, you should be able to um, quote your rates, if you may, with regards to this. A um, few other questions. Uh, oh, should we consider the KPI for perforation for colonoscopy quality. One in a thousand seems too high for a diagnostic scope and too low for a complex polypectomy. So 
So what's the question actually? Okay. KPI. Uh, key performance indicator, I a know, KPI. But, yeah, what's the question? Actually? So should we consider uh, a KPI for perforation for colonoscopy quality? So right now, uh, we seem to sort of tell patients that the risk of perforation is about one in a thousand for diagnostic colonoscopies. Um, this seems, uh, I mean, this seems too high for diagnostic colonoscopy. Probably it should be lower and f too low for complex polypectomies, which we quote as about one to two percent. Yeah. I think to, to yeah. your question, Andrew, I, I think again, it's, it's difficult to do that, isn't it? But I, I guess my main question is yes. around the one in a thousand, and I yes. hope there's no one in this room that would accept a one in a thousand perforation rate for a diagnostic colonoscopy and yet that seems to be what we continue even with yeah. I mean, 20 years ago yes that was what we considered the endoscopes and colonoscopes are far more advanced and it's far less likely to perforate i wonder why we're still talking one in a thousand yeah. but you still did there are operators dependence factors like you know trainees as well so the the, the risk may be different in the different people uh, so this one in a thousand perhaps is, is an overall risk i think Perhaps, yeah. I think we should be aiming for much better than that. Yep. Um, question, how do you retrieve large polyps after EMR in the right colon? I, I mean, for me personally, uh, you just uh, make sure they're out of the way. Um, and as best as can, so this is a question from New Zealand, as best as you can, if the, uh, the specimens are about 1.5, 1 to 1 1.5 centimeter, I try to suck them through the scope first, so they just get out of the way. You want to complete the procedure. And then whatever is left there, which cannot come through, uh, sometimes you wish you had a larger channel, but that's not always the case. Then you may either want to use a rot net. Um, sometimes there's only one large specimen left. The rest has been sucked through. So you then don't need to use a rot net and just take it off through suction. Um, if you do use the rot net, though, I would try to get all of the lesion, uh, all of the remnants of the lesion out. And then on withdrawal, push the rot net um, probably a few centimeters away so I can inspect the rest of the, the bubble on the way out. That, that's what I would do. Uh, I, I find that to be quite useful so you don't tend to miss synchronous lesions elsewhere. Sometimes that can be the case as well. Uh, what do you do, Gregor? Yeah, exactly the same. If there's one big piece, um, I would just grab it. At the yeah. I would just use the snare as well. And yeah. you can use, like the Rothnet, you can drag it a yeah. few centimeters away. Yeah. It sometimes cuts in half, and it's not the end of the world. That is also the use of rectal over tube to help retrieve very big ESD specimens. I also once heard that uh, there is this um, wait for the patient to defecate. So basically, you chap enema, put put a collector there, and then uh, wait for the patient to pass. You, you're already there, so you might as well just complete the job. Actually, you know, <laughs> the problem is you take them out of the room. In recovery, and you know, but these are very big lesions, as in more than ten cm circumferential. Oh. Those oh, okay, lesions. yes, you're talking about ESD sort of lesions, is it? Um, I don't know whether this is pertinent to this. Uh, when will there be a CMBS code for EMR? <laughs> I think they'll have to ask this to William here. No, no, he's gone. He was. I so think it's in the works. It's in the works yeah. as a summary, and um, it's to the point of um, that there is a descriptor for yep. it. Uh, William has done great work in for pushing this through the MSAC process, and I think also has enabled the wording to include cold snare, um, so that it's not. It, it was going to be restricted to diathermy-based polypectomy, but that's no longer the case. Yes. So I think possibly, I guess, timing-wise, it's unlikely to get through in March. It may get through in November. Yeah, they're looking at um, the uh, the margin. Sorry, the 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 size of the polyp is going to be put at twenty five millimeters, not twenty. But Which that's actually still, the yeah. other. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to um, say uh, in relation, not perhaps to the the twenty five millimeter yeah. polyp, but George's point about um, measuring polyps, which is very important. But of course, we are very bad at it. Yep. And David Hewitt's done some nice, nice work illustrating just how bad we are at measuring polyp size. And so, and you alluded to this, Raj, you can use 
uh, tools that you have at your disposal, like obviously snares that are of known width, but snare catheters tend to be about three millimetres, give or take, so that's quite a useful line in the sand for small polyps. You know, use something to compare, because we are very bad. Do you think, George? Yeah. Totally agree. So, so the, j just to take on from, from Gregor there, the, the snare size is quite interesting. So once you open the snare, so the diameter of the snare, so if you ask uh, for a 10 millimeter snare, for instance, it's from, it's not the longitudinal length, it's the horizontal length, all right? So that's 10 mm, all right? So remember that because uh, you may think the 10 mm snare is actually the longitudinal length, especially for those diamond shaped uh, slightly oval type um, snares. It's, it's actually the horizontal length from one edge of the, I guess, wire to the other. Um, Gregor, question for you. You mentioned a, a lower recurrence rate for SSAs with the cold snare. Does this relate to easier interrogation of the margins when diatomy is not used? Does that relate to interrogation? No. I think um, these larger cold uh, serrated lesions that we're removing with cold EMR, we are lifting them. And as we saw yesterday, when you put fluid underneath these guys with some dye, they really sit up nicely. The margin then becomes really obvious. And the technique involves making sure you get millimetres of normal tissue all around, working from one side to the other. So. You know, it's interesting, and, and we talked about this yesterday again, in the, in the era of snare tip coagulation to reduce the recurrence rate of adenomas at hot EMR, then intuitively, if you're doing cold EMR, you should probably do that. But it turns out, um, at least in the, the, the data from David Hewitt and Nick Tatucci and also the data I showed at the end from Alan Moss and, and our group, uh, it's not necessary. But I don't know, the biology of that is weird. I don't really understand it, and I assume it's just adequacy of cold snare resection. Mm. I think I think part of the data also relates to the ability to to see these margins uh, more clearly these days with the yeah. better scopes we have, and that also probably holds a little bit true for the the um, the, the hot snare study. I think we can see them better, and once we interrogate the margins, we probably aim to sort of uh, resect any residual polyp and then mm. burn the rest. Yeah. So the fact that we interrogating things a little bit better I think has led to a lower recurrence rate yeah, I compared think to true. what was previously quoted. And I think also the cold snare goes through the serrated lesion so much more cleanly than through yes. even um, you know two A adenomas that uh, it, it's, a, it's a cleaner cut. Yeah. So question um, can the snare tip soft coagulation data be believed when the control arm for recurrence rate is about 20% which is probably much higher than other data sets. So in brackets, uh, presumably relating to fellows performing the procedure. Ooh, harsh. <laughs> um, well, if you look at series around the world, 20% yeah. is pretty standard. Yeah. And I, I just think uh, it's, it's, again, uh, I think it's a reflection of, of the newer scopes which we use these days. Um, you, you can really see better. Um, even small one millimeter remnants at the edges, which you may have overlooked. Once you start doing the STSC method and you're moving around, you suddenly notice that uh, sometimes certain uh, little remnants of adenoma is at, at that edge, and you wouldn't want to coagulate that. You would probably want to resect it, take it off, and then carry on coagulation. So that's what I would do so I think it's the f the fact that you're doing it and interrogating the margins is what is leading to a, a lower recurrence rate I would like to strongly echo what Raj say I normally teach my junior that don't don't hesitate once you reset don't hesitate to just pull out the lesion and call it a day interrogate the margins and clearly check whether there's any residue on it because to to come back and reset the recurrence is much more difficult than do it now yeah um, yeah, sorry, there's just so many questions. Um, Professor Ho, yeah. um, any data on interval cancers on patients already on a polyp surveillance program? And what are your comments? Yeah, I mean, uh, as shown in on our slide just now, we, we do have some inter interval uh, colorectal cancers uh, rate as shown. 
Um, okay. So, can I, the, this yeah. is really interesting because yeah. and it, it comes back partly to Andrew's point about complications um, and interval cancer is really interesting. If I looked at the data for this for a medico legal case um, recently and if you look at the data from, if you are the best colonoscopist, so Doug Rex, the best data out there, you will miss a cancer one in 2,000 colonoscopies. That's the best. The worst is down to about one in 300. So, you know, really, really, really good colonoscopists miss cancer. Yep. And it must be part of your consent because it happens and it's, it's, it's a failure of the test, not the individual necessarily, depending on where your rate is. And the only way you can protect yourself from that is to do really good colonoscopy and, as you said earlier, know your numbers, know your ADR, know your SDR, know your completion rates, know your bowel preps, optimise everything, take lots of photos, image, document really well. Um, perhaps this is uh, maybe Andrew Andrew Luck can get into this um, comments on recommendation of not to do further surveillance beyond 75 years of age <laughs> is this working? Can you hear me okay yeah Look, it's, I'm not sure how you, why you've chosen me for this one. I, I thought uh, you were involved in some of the, the guidelines. Uh, not that particular okay. one. Right. But look, it, it is becoming an issue. Um, uh, just talking about it from a clinical point of view, uh, a healthy 75-year-old uh, is easily offended when you tell them that they don't need surveillance anymore. Um, they're also easily offended by not getting faecal alcohol blood tests from the bowel cancer screening yep. program. I'm not <laughs> sure if anyone's picked up on that. Um, and, and my usual explanation, uh, I, I guess the first point is that the guidelines actually say 80 unless there are comorbidities. So, so if you've got a healthy 75-year-old, uh, it is justified to continue surveillance colonoscopy. Uh, and, and the approach that I take to my 80-plus-year-olds is that I talk about risk and benefit. You know, we are talking about finding small polyps that will slowly grow and give you trouble in a decade's time and at that point the patient usually has a giggle and says I'm not going to be around in a decade's time and you're sort of off the hook at that point. Um, it's also important to talk about the fact that guidelines are related to a population discussion not an individual sitting in front of you. So that person at 81 might be perfectly safe to have a colonoscopy but when we write guidelines we're looking at every 81 yep. year old and there are lots of them that are not safe to have a surveillance colonoscopy. So I think if you approach it in that way, then you can come back to the individual and talk about their role, the, the surveillance colonoscopy in them. Well, what would you do, Gary and Devinder? What's your sort of take on this? It's not really chronological age, it's the physiological age. I've got a lot of 60-year-olds who look 90 and I won't <laughs> colonoscope. So it depends on the comorbidities, but I've got I've got 80 year olds who turn up who look 60 right to bike to see me and you can't say no to them because they ask you why are you going to say no and you've got to be honest and but I think if you select more on pathophysiology that they've got rather than their chronology you'll probably be fine. Yeah I have a similar approach essentially it's, it's a sort of a robust discussion with the patient often this can be avoided if at the initial step the GP has a discussion so you can often see an elderly patient with multiple comorbid disease coming with a positive fecal occult blood test, and then you're stuck and, you know. But it, it, usually most patients are quite practical, yep. and they will see, see, see the point. Yep. Charles? I, I agree with all the, all the points made um, on this. We actually had a look at the, this data because we have a look at lots of um, polyp-related bowel cancer surveillance data. And um, the, the best predictor for future advanced neoplasia is advanced neoplasia. So particularly in this age group. So as people get older, um, they, they develop repeat advanced lesions. So if, if they've had a, my approach has been, if they've had an advanced lesion in the past, um, I'm quite reticent to stop uh, surveying them. And, but, I, but I take all of the other um, points into consideration, particularly the biological age and comorbidities. I think it's 
great that they put a line in the sand in the guidelines so yep. that there can be a discussion with patients. And a number of my patients, maybe it's just me, who go, oh, thank God. Don't know the colonoscopy, yeah. but also the concept. And I offer them if I'm, you know, if I, I'm not really convinced, I say, look, I'm going to send you a letter in five years, and you'll be 82. But it's optional, you know. If you get the letter and you think, oh my God, then just ring us and tell us. You don't have to come. Yeah. And um, and our, my letter now has that in it. If you're over 75, this may be optional because you know historically, I'm not going to go through every recall um, to cover that. Kit? Um, this is not so much screening but more to what Devinda was saying when the GP has done the screening already on someone who's not really fit for a colonoscopy. Um, you talk about whether they want, if cancer would make a difference to diagnose regardless of whether they'd have an operation. I think something that's underutilised in Australia, which we used a lot in England, is virtual colonoscopy. And Medicare will now cover it for people who are deemed not to be medically fit for a colonoscopy. And so in a lot of my over 75-year-olds, I just talk to them about the risk and benefit. You won't pick up as much. You'll pick up advanced adenomas and or larger lesions. So I tend to use a lot of virtual CT colonoscopy in the older patients. Good point. Charles? Yeah. Um, and, and we've looked at this too. Um, so a diff slightly different aspect. Um, and I, I agree with you again, Kate, on, on that. Um, the problem is what are you going to do with what you find? If they're not fit to have a colonoscopy, they're not going to be fit for surgery uh, for the most part. So, so you've got to include that in your discussion with the patient. Um, the, in, in terms of, of GPs doing FIT testing, um, I had a specific look at this. Uh, about half of our FIT positive patients come from GPs, and the reason why they do FIT testing is very different from uh, the National Bowel Cancer Program. So they do FIT testing for symptomatic patients. So they're trying to get them into the system, they're symptomatic, um, and they have an additional uh, FIT positive test. So that's vast majority of, of patients tested by GPs in, in our, in our um, area, certainly. That's, that's where the FIT test comes from. Um, in that setting, um, I have conflicting data, but some data suggests that their risk is actually higher of having um, adverse pathology, depending to some degree on their age and, and gender as well. And again, I mean, the new guidelines, the symptomatic patient chapter, FOBT is, is, is not just a screening tool anymore. It is, you know, something that adds weight to symptoms. Bell prep, and if they're not fit for a colonoscopy and they're going to get bell prep, most of the ones I have are turned down because they won't survive the bell prep. So they're going to have to have bell prep for a CD colonography. You haven't done them a favour because they actually give them pico prep type prep rather than a peg type prep, so they're more likely to get dehydrated and end up in hospital. <laughs> yes, Andrew. I would just say that as a surgeon, I think Devendra will back me up on this, who gets patients referred by Gary. Everything he says about his patient cohort is true. <laughs> <laughs> We, we have some time for some video, so can you put that up, Hugh? Um, it's, it's because uh, we'll, uh, we'll cut short the, the last session a little bit, so, and then we'll have uh, some tea after this. This, this is uh, just a, a lesion which looks like a typical SSA. Uh, this patient was referred because uh, the lesion was apparently difficult to remove. It was tattooed as well. So you, you can um, you can actually see this uh, sort of uh, just go back a bit. Um, so uh, we we decided to just call snare this. Um, uh, it, it is an SSA. There's typical uh, sort of features which uh, we described yesterday, and you can see this uh, sort of uh, some mucosa which has taken the whole uh, tattoo in it. So it's become black. Um, as you can see there. The, the issue is that we found this other lesion next door, um, which, which, which was uh, a little bit tricky because, you know, you've got one SSA now, and the issue is, uh, is this another SSA? W w what do people think? Yeah, so uh, that's a good point, uh, Jaya. So, this this actually um, so you spend a bit of time looking at it you know you, you may think it's yeah it's an SSA there's another SSA tattoo there you have a look and you wait for a bit uh, because there are these typical ring-like patterns around it 
um, which you will see shortly there and um, as, as you are uh, putting in some water you, you can actually see that uh, the that's actually a diverticulum which has inverted so you want to wouldn't want to put a hot snare around this and take it off um, it's slowly trying to coax the diverticulum where it belongs I suppose yeah as you can see there so uh, it, it does help to I suppose uh, spend a bit of time looking at things so this was an inverted diverticulum Um, this is another fairly good video, um, which was not not from yesterday. Uh, this was also in video GIE um, uh, of uh, what 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 I think is sometimes helpful, especially for this uh, um, lesions um, similar to to uh, to to yesterday case uh, this was a large lesion and uh, wh what's interesting is uh, we got the snare round um, in interestingly it's it almost mimics yesterday's case though yesterday's patient was a bit uh, the lesion was a bit larger so anyway uh, we, we we put the snare around this and we took it off and this is what you find so occasionally uh, you uh, you would think that perhaps this is uh, submucosa it looks blue after all, you did inject some submucosal, uh, some sort of submucosal fluid around it, or maybe you may want to convince yourself that that is muscularis mucosa, and submucosa is behind that. But uh, th this is in the in the uh, uh, rectum again. Um, so uh, we obviously uh, knew what we were dealing with. That's uh, sort of extra peritoneal, be beyond the peritoneal refraction. So it's extra peritoneal um, and uh, we decided that once the the polyp is clear as, as what you saw yesterday we cleared the polyp uh, around we, we um, put the we injected it and then we um, we closed it up and continued the resection so so it is uh, sometimes uh, you know we expect this this black hole um, or you know this uh, perforation like uh, thing but it's actually not the case in the rectum you do find this um, extra rectal tissue taking up the the dye interestingly so yeah we had a similar case yesterday the patient's all right he's, he's doing okay um, and we closed that lesion up and then we decided to uh, uh, carry on the resection so this is uh, just another example um, of a case, um, and uh, be interested to know what um, what you think. So this is a non-granular lesion; it's on a fold, and uh, it, it worries you when there's slight depression as well, um, and and that's what you see in in the pit pattern. You can actually make out that uh, you know it's not amorphous. Uh, there's still capillaries around that area, um, and hence uh, the decision was made to uh, sort of uh, resect this um, using the. Um, so you can see the depressed area there. So we used the ESD method to take this off. Um, this was in the uh, right colon, and then we just closed it up. Though there was no real area which was. Uh, concerning you can see quite a lot of uh, sort of fibrotic tissue there um, you know and that that helps sometimes to again uh, image the area and then work things out uh, histology came back as a tubular villus adenoma interestingly um, I hope I have enough battery left um, this is another case um, which is quite interesting so if there are questions, please keep them coming. We will uh, adjourn at 3 p.m. Uh, this is another case uh, of uh, depressed uh, lesion. Um, and, you know, somebody is asking, how do you sometimes assess large lesions? You go to the most abnormal area and try to sort of uh, interrogate it further. So you can actually see the depressed area does not really have um, much of uh, an issue with regards to capillaries. 
um, and and hence uh, we were able to uh, we were able to uh, give it some juice. We were able to resect this. Uh, you can see that that pattern there. So the most abnormal layer, hone your scope on it, and then try to interrogate it further. So uh, we we uh, took this off uh, using the ESD method as well. Um, it's so you know it really depends. Uh, sometimes it's important. Like yesterday's case, we we had uh, after retroflexing with a gastroscope, we found fifty percent of the polyp behind as well. So sometimes that can help uh, to to resect these lesions. Um, and it really depends on gravity more than anything in the colon. It's it's quite uh, tricky sometimes um, with, with gravity acting against you. But once you have gravity on your side, um, it's fairly easy if it, once it lifts out. This this is another thing which you know I I, I know it, it's not commonly seen, but you'd be surprised. So you know this is in the rectum. It's quite magnified, but um, it's about six to seven mm. Um, it looks like a hyperplastic polyp, but um, I, I don't have the white light image. There was actually a yellowish hue, and there was not stool um, around the polyp or sort of in the polyp. So again, just oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, so that's stool, of course, but this, this is the polyp. Um, so it does not look like a hyperplastic polyp. This, these are typical rectal nets. You know, they, they really have this kind of look. Um, so we decided to then resect it. Interestingly, they stay pinned down to the to the underlying uh, uh, submucosa all almost all of the time. It's quite uh, difficult to sometimes remove them. But uh, you know, uh, this is the white light image which you can try to sort of remember because this is not uncommon. You, you do some, sometimes find them, though there's a lot of rectal sort of hyperplastic polyps around. Yes. Sometimes, yeah. the ones, the um, you're just going through and you take it off with a cold snare, not realising what it is, yes. and then you get the pathology back. Yep. Uh, it's a carcinoidal net in yes. the rectum. So what do you do then? Um, it's a problem, right? We discuss them in the colorectal MDT, but um, uh, we certainly, uh, I think the intent then is to bring them back quickly. Uh, you've got to find them. Uh, and uh, try to resect them. So have you used the full thickness resection device for that? Uh, no, not in the rectum, I haven't. Um, I think that's helpful as well. And it's quite straightforward to use. It's you know close to the anal verge. Uh, the worst thing to do about the FDR uh, device is to try to get to the cecum. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is so bulky, it's yeah. about 2.1 to 2.2 centimeters and it's really tricky yeah. to get there. But in the rectum, it's fairly easy. The thing you have to be aware or careful of is, and I'm sure Devinda and Andrew will tell you, is that you just don't know where the other organs are around, um, you know, outside the rectum. And uh, you just hope you don't capture something else outside yes. the rectum. Yes. You, of course, yes. the lower in the rectum, the safer, um, and a male patient is considerably safer than a female patient, uh, particularly anteriorly. Uh, in fact, I was interested uh, in Raj being concerned about a perforation in the rectum, whereas we would take a, a full thickness excision of a, of a lesion surgically and probably not even close it. Mm -hmm. uh, so much less concerned about those uh, in the appropriate posteriorly or, or anteriorly in a male. I'm much less concerned about that. He wasn't concerned. <laughs> he was cool as a cucumber. <laughs> I've seen that in action too. <laughs> okay, we'll just put put this uh, last one. It's just to I illustrate, I guess. Uh, maybe you would have seen it last year, but I, I think this this is quite fascinating. Um, an SSA, obviously, there's a lot of uh, mucus on one area, and I think Gregor uh, showed uh, some of this on his slide as well. This the dysplastic component next to the SSA. Can, can you see that open pits there? Mm. And then you can see an adenoma-like picture on, on this side. Mm. So, uh, so you, you want to ensure you resect this carefully, right? So uh, dysplastic um, SSA 
would uh, quickly develop into something else within a year, actually, fairly quick progression. So you want to ensure you get the whole piece out, if possible, in one piece. Uh, be interested to know, Gregor, quotes now? Well, you know, a bit worried here about margins and whatnot. Yeah, I think, if you can, it, I think the main thing is to get it on block. Yeah. Um, you know, if they were on Warfarin, and Clopidogrel and the bigger tran, then um, I would do it cold snare. But I'd make sure I get this plastic piece as much of that as I could um, in in one piece and make sure that comes out. But yeah, I, I agree. These this plastic serrated lesions are high grade lesions, and um, the key thing is to get it all out because if you only take the visibly dysplastic bit, thinking oh it's a little adenoma, and miss the serrated bit, and, and Michael Burke talks about this a lot then they will get interval cancer because that is a lesion that has expressed yep. itself as a high-grade lesion and you haven't actually completely removed it. Yes. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, what, what's the best approach, uh, oh, what, what's the best approach to multiple rectal hyperplastic polyps, especially tiny one to two millimeter ones? <laughs> if it is that tiny, you usually we uh, dis dis uh, ignore them. But a uh, bigger one, last, larger than 1 cm, perhaps is good to resect them, just not to uh, miss out any dysplastic pop focus inside. OK, um, yeah. Uh, I, I tend to, yeah, if you've got 20 of those, I just tend to ignore them. That, that's what I do. Uh, but um, you, know, you can't be resecting all of them. Just but your endoscopic diagnosis has to be of high confidence. Let's say you're not sure, not too high confidence, you think there may be a sulcerated component, then perhaps you resect them. Okay, uh, just last two questions, then we'll break. Um, this sounds like a painful question. Um, how close to the dented line are you happy to place a clip? Hanging out. <laughs> um, so, uh, so whenever we do, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, we've got a few colorectal surgeons here, which is great, but uh, when we do uh, some of these ESDs, uh, it's actually quite surprising. We, we can cut through the dented line and work our way more proximally, if you may, uh, towards the uh, rectal lesion. Um, patients do have pain. Uh, sometimes we put a bit of lignocaine in, in that injected, uh, and that helps. And towards the end of the uh, procedure, I also uh, use a bit of lignocaine gel and then uh, put them on uh, paracetamol for a few days, and it tends to work well. Um, but of course, uh, just like banding of hemorrhoids, I guess, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the other thing in the distal rectum is they often get a bacteremia yes. uh, a few hours later, so a shot of a kef or whatever yes. is very helpful to avoid that. Yeah. And um, yes, Andrew, you want to say something? Oh, only that it's a little bit easier for us when patients come to see us, they expect to leave with pain, so it's not quite <laughs> such an issue. <laughs> Okay. Can I also <laughs> add, Raj, that if the yes. I, I strongly believe that if the bands are put correctly, they should be painless. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hundred um, percent. So uh, uh, that that leaves the the last word to both of our surgeons. Uh, w question to the surgeons: What distance is the uh, peritoneal reflection? I guess from the anal verge. What's the endoscopic distance, if you may? Uh, so rule of thumb uh, posteriorly, and of course it's much more difficult endoscopically to know whether you're posterior or anterior um, uh, as opposed to doing it as a surgical resection. Um, so posteriorly about 15 centimetres, okay. um, anteriorly uh, 10 centimetres in a male, 5 in a female, and yeah. laterally it sort of curves up from that anterior, um, uh, so the anterior is always lower and it curves around um, to the, uh, on the lateral size yeah. to the posterior area. But it's a reasonable rule of thumb in, in uh, uh, someone of normal stature that you will find uh, the posterior reflection at about 15 centimetres. Okay. Um, with that, I think we'll break for tea, and we'll be back here at uh, half past three Sorry, for our last two lectures. Thank you to the speakers and the chairs. Thank you, Thank you again. Thank you.